Outrocast. You doing good, man? Sony, I'm talking to a legend yet again. I'm doing great. Are you doing great? <laughs> yeah, I survived the tour and uh, and uh, lived to tell about it as a 60-year-old. So, hey. A uh, hell of a tour. We're going to come back to that if you don't mind. But let's first... Uh, Let's talk about Light of Joy, the new EP. It's out this month. When did you actually track Light of Joy? I uh, decided to get ahead of tracking uh, the EP Light of Joy. So during the first couple of weeks of the tour, while my voice was still pretty fresh and my mind was still pretty clear, I uh, started tracking that thing in Nashville, uh, at least a couple of the songs. And I'm glad I got ahead of it. it, it, it in the grand picture, it takes about a month after the tour to get my voice back. I'm just getting it back now. Wow. So was it one of those cases where you knew that you were in there during beautiful weather, but you set up the Christmas lights in the studio to try and give it a little bit of a holiday vibe? <laughs> I mean, yes, that is the biggest difficulty of creating Christmas music is you rarely ever record it uh, during Christmas uh, unless... Maybe you do, but yeah, I was in there, you know, feeling like, how do we do the Jingle Bells vibe? How do we create sleigh bells and uh, all the things that Christmas is about? Uh, you just make it up in your mind. <laughs> yeah, people who are longtime fans of yours know that you're a heck of a songwriter, that you're a guitar player and all that. But where do the drums factor in with this music? Is it the first thing you track or is it an way afterthought? Uh, there's a couple different origin stories with the different songs, but uh, probably three different ways we did it for this EP. One of my favorite ways was me sitting with guys in a room playing bass and guitar and keyboards and me on a drum set. We did that uh, in the main studio uh, with Lee Turner. Uh, and it, that's great. It's live. It feels like you're a band, even if you've just started understanding the song con conceptually uh, as a, a four piece arrangement. It's mm -hmm. great. It, it feels like it's supposed to, you know, you're making live music instead of just pressing things on computer keyboards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where did the drums start in your musical upbringing versus guitar? I was born a drummer and I remember drumming from the earliest age, uh, well before I had a drum set in front of me. Eventually, I got lessons and organized it in my mind. The, the manifestation of sounds isn't any good unless you can organize it. And I got drum lessons. And from there on, I drummed my little heart out till I was 21 when I joined my first uh, formal band. And uh, it was a couple bands before Hootie. By the time I got to Hootie, I was already writing songs on guitar and piano, singing a little bit. So I had... Uh, a variety of skills, but drumming has always been the highest and, and the one I rest on. I like to find out that stuff because Ben Folds, for example, supposedly a better drummer than he is a piano player, but piano was first. And then you hear, you know, do you know Stacy Jones from American Hi-Fi? He used to be in uh, Veruca Salt and all that? No, but I know Ben Folds and he's got a great drum uh, songwriter, pianist uh, story as well. Yeah. But in, in the case of Stacy Jones, great drummer, I think he's still Miley Cyrus's music director. He only started on guitar by taking off, I think, the bottom three strings, doing the drop D on the low E string, and just barring the frets. And that's kind of where he started with guitar. Where did you start off with guitar? Did you learn the basic cowboy chords, the open chords? I was a huge fan of uh, what they now call prime country. So 80s country, uh, George Strait, Travis Tritt, Garth Brooks in the early days. And I wanted to mimic that songwriting because I really loved it, along with classic rock and, and some other things. Uh, yeah. I had a few friends around me playing guitar and the guitarist from a band I was in before Hootie and the Blowfish called Tootie and the Jones. Uh, the guitarist Tootie Baruti taught me some of the finer points of how to play guitar. And I really really was intrigued and I realized it was a pathway to sounding like prime country which is where my heart was at the time and thankfully uh Tootie uh, sort of showed me some Zeppelin too to balance it out and some and some yes and uh, some Joe Jackson and a variety of uh old and contemporary rock 
and bring things full circle, you know, seeing you at Jones Beach, one of the covers you did was a Zeppelin cover and your percussionist went on to the kit for that one. And then during the show, we see you playing guitar and all that. Was there ever hesitation in Hootie for them going, yeah, you can play guitar and all that? Yeah, it might have been out of a little boredom that any of us started switching instruments. We've been doing that since I remember being in the band. Uh, Darius used to play bass on a song in the old, old days. Uh, Dean would play acoustic guitar on a Bob Marley cover. And uh, we always dabbled. It kept things interesting. So yeah. none of what you see on the stage in 2024 is uh, uh, contrived or, or new. It's uh, the nature of Hootie the Blowfish. Let's let's open our, our eyes a little bit. Let's broaden our horizons and pick up an instrument maybe you're not perfect at <laughs> and see what comes out of it. Yeah, we did see you on acoustic guitar during the acoustic portion of the show, which was fantastic. So what around what year, because you mentioned 2D around there was your introduction to guitar. So have you been playing guitar for 35 years at this point? Yeah, I mean, I've been playing since probably 1987. And uh, it's, it's I'm only still okay at it. I, I'm, I'm fine being a novice or basic guitarist. I just needed to get learn how to get around the neck to create chord progressions. That was kind of my uh, motivator. Same with piano. I had a piano teacher at the University of South Carolina when I was a student, teach me some basic triads on piano and chords so I could mimic, again, probably prime country, <laughs> but also classic rock and, and balladry. Uh, I love that kind of music. So I was learning uh, from the beginning just to learn enough to to write songs. And bringing up that tour again, I had the pleasure of seeing the Jones Beach show. Incredible, incredible show. And that's a venue which you've weirdly been playing now for 30 plus years. But um, most artists would have that really successful summer tour and just sit back and do nothing for a while. But the last few years, not only is there this new EP, your memoir did really well. There was the reissue with the new music, the 15th anniversary thing. It seems like you're creating in some form every day. I've really had a good sort of wellspring of creativity. You're right. I uh, could, have never been able to control when it's on high speed or, or when the well is a little dry. So when it's coming and you've got the time in your schedule to uh, sort of bring it along with you. Yeah, you, you got to get it out there. I, I, I can't stand shelving projects and, and putting things off for some other time. Let's record it and put it out there. And I've, I've enjoyed being creative around this Hootie tour. Uh, the Summer Camp with Trucks tour was amazing. Jones Beach, one of our favorite places to get back to because it's some of our earliest memories uh, playing big cities and big venues in city like Jones Beach, uh, Madison Square Garden. Some of these places are iconic. And to go back to Jones Beach again in uh, 2024 to a huge and fun crowd just warmed my heart. Uh, I love being creative and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out ways to, to do it. Maybe there'll be a, you know, a desert up ahead. Who knows? So I might as well get this stuff out there. <laughs> I'd imagine that memoir that I mentioned was the hardest project that you ever had to work on. And I'm projecting because uh, writing a couple books myself, you realize writing a book is very little about actually writing the book. There's so much uh, promotion behind the scenes stuff, reliving stuff, et cetera. So in your case, do you ever plan on doing a follow-up memoir? I'm not sure that, a follow-up memoir would be the direction I go for a second book. I want to write again. I know it's a huge endeavor to yep. sit down and say, I'm going to write a hundred or 400 pages. So you kind of got to really uh, be patient. It took me almost four years to get mine started and finished. And uh, so my second book, whether it's a memoir or not, I'm hoping to make it a little quicker, <laughs> maybe a couple of years. <laughs> I've got a couple ideas. There's a lot of different creative routes that interest me uh, besides just a memoir. I think people have heard enough about me anyway. I think they can uh, find something more <laughs> along a different line. I'd have to imagine though, you're one of those people where 
there's so many stories from touring over the years that we haven't heard that that could be one of those directions that it could go. So I don't think we've heard too much about you, to be honest. There's, yeah, there's uh, probably uh, some pathways in between in the seams and the creases where uh, you may have heard the big things and the uh, about Hootie and the Blowfish, but what about in between? What, are, what do some of the other moments mean? I mean, I read Darius's book and I learned a considerable amount uh, of things that he hadn't shared uh, with me or with the band or publicly that happened long ago. So I think there's value to digging back in there and maybe finding some things to bring up uh, that are worth talking about. And then you also have Tim Summers' great book as well that you could correct and or compliment in, in part of your book. <laughs> I am going to have to stay out of the business of correcting anyone else's truth. I have found that, uh, that the truth is a wider berth than I had ever imagined uh, when I started reading other books about things uh, that were happening with me or with Mark, Dean, Darius. It's crazy how you can look back and ask four people that were in the same room where a thing happened and get a, a variety of answers. And I respect that. Honestly, I, I can't even claim that some of the uh, memories I have uh, are the honest and only truth. I got my dates right in my book. I got the places right in my book. I'm yeah. pretty darn confident about that. But my gosh, we all remember things different, right? It's hard to say who's right or wrong. It's easy to say Alex Van Halen is wrong because when you read his book, it <laughs> seems like we remember more about Van Halen than he does. Like his dates are wrong. His sequences of events are wrong. So you fortunately did not fall into that trap. Now, wait, I just picked up that book about a week ago. I have not yet uh, uh, opened it yet. I, it's a good warning to uh, maybe uh, take a grain of salt with the reading of Alex's book? I, in my honest opinion, again, you know more about Van Halen than Alex Van Halen does. That's what you're going to come <laughs> away from after you read this book and you see that he's quoted at least seven other people's books. Did, did your book quote everyone else's book within it? I don't think it did. No, no. I was, I had some really great advisors when I wrote my book and I'm so thankful that I had my, uh, my wife, Laura. I had a couple of people that were in publishing that were not publishing my book that were willing to share some really important uh, advising advisories with me to For keep sure. me on track and, and stay out of trouble so I didn't uh, regret it later. I'm so thankful for a group of people. They're in my acknowledgments in the book. Uh, so I made sure and list them. And, uh, for the record, Alex Van Halen's acknowledgments do not include Michael Anthony or Sammy Hagar in the thank yous and acknowledgments. So take that with a grain of salt as well. But uh, back to you, Sony. Uh, two questions and then I let you go. The first one, uh, you have this new EP, but are you already thinking about more original music or the next EP? I am. I have. Uh, I record music on my own sort of pace. Uh, in between Hootie tours and now, as we see, during a Hootie tour. Uh, and so I've got enough music for a new project, and I'm really excited about the songs. Uh, you know, I think it could be something that would be for 2025 uh, or early 2026. It's so much easier to record than it ever has been in this world of technology. So mm -hmm. I'm not waiting for a record label to sign me. I'm not... Uh, waiting mm -hmm. on a band around me to, to make the timing correct for me. I can lead the show. I can get the musicians and I can get the studio time. And, and I like being in charge in that sense. It allows me, if the mood is right, if the timing is right, to put out a new project, whether it's a, a spiritual project, a holiday project, or uh, mm -hmm. even just a secular uh, project of any sort. So I, I, I like being in the driver's seat like that. Uh, last question. It sounds like a stock question, but it's really a compliment wrapped up in a stock question. And that's uh, when I think about your musical career, one of the biggest selling albums of all time, arena, amphitheater tours on and off for 30-ish years. You did at the peak of late night television, every late night show, imaginable, et cetera. But is there anything in your career that you're still hoping would happen? Is there anything that you haven't done yet there's not and it's not that things are, are big or exciting uh it's i want to do things that are impactful 
And mm. those can be small things uh, that are, are not on television. Those could be uh, getting in front of groups that uh, have a deep connection with your words or your music. And so the bucket list isn't uh, winning another Grammy or uh, playing Madison Square Garden again necessarily. It's more along the lines of uh, impacting people who are looking for something, a uh, musical experience uh, that I can help or a, a spiritual experience even that I can help bring along to them. We're connected as humans and I found the more meaningful things to be the personal, uh, the personal interactions. So while playing to 15,000 people a night this summer was amazing and powerful, I had an incredible time meeting 40 to 50 people each night who were buying my book and waiting in line for a selfie than I did on the stage, especially as the drummer who's set back a little bit further in the, on the drum set. I like meeting people and knowing a little bit about them. And so some of my highlights going forward, I think will be more of that interpersonal connection. Outro cast.